I'm Antonio Tijerino of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, and thank you for following along with HTTP's Digital Inclusion Summit 2022. As we continue the conversation about an inclusive and digital future for all, we also must remember the hard and collaborative work it will take to end the disparities in access to affordable internet service and closing the tech equity gap. While this includes empowering local and federal governments to use infrastructure funds to promote inclusive public policies that ensure equitable and access to broadband, it also means providing the tools for the Latino community for adoption and increased digital skills. For our community, this translates to having a choice of wired and wireless options available at an affordable price. It also means the availability of adoption and digital skill programs like my organization's, the Hispanic Heritage Foundation's Code as a Second Language effort that helps underrepresented minorities develop the skills our youth and adults need to succeed in our 21st century digital economy. Without important access to broadband, along with sufficient digital services, our youngest learners continue to face barriers to a quality education. Our disabled communities are unable to access life-saving telehealth service. And workers that face job displacement are unable to access skills and training necessary to participate in a changing workforce. So thank you, HTTP, our partners and coalition members for continuing this important discussion. And thank you to Senator Patty Murray and her ongoing efforts with the Digital Equity Act to ensure funds continue to help our communities. Hi, everyone. This is Senator Patty Murray, and I'm delighted to join you all for this year's Digital Inclusion Summit. For so many of us, having a reliable broadband connection is almost as important today as running water or electricity. But for too long, it's been out of reach for so many people. That's why I work to pass my bill, the Digital Equity Act, in the bipartisan infrastructure law President Biden signed last year. My bill will help make sure everyone has the tools and support to get online and will deliver funding to state and local entities who are on the ground and already leading when it comes to digital inclusion. And this is just one of many ways the bipartisan infrastructure law will help people in Washington state and across the country get online for less. The law will also put at least $45 billion towards expanding broadband coverage, reduce internet costs for households with low incomes, and more. The funding alone is going to be a big deal, but ensuring that digital inclusion is at the center of these investments will be so important to the overall success of this package. So I'm fighting to ensure that once someone has a reliable internet connection, they're able to make the most of it, creating opportunity for so many people in a big, big way. Thank you again for inviting me to join you all and know I will continue to be your proud partner in the fight for digital equity. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today um, on a conversation about expanding digital opportunity um, for every home everywhere um, and thinking about um, how broadband adoption, um, affordability, and digital skills are actually a racial equity issue and how it's really important to think about these issues from the lens of racial equity to ensure that all of our communities are not only included, but really able to thrive and take advantage of all the benefits that come with access to broadband. So we're really excited today um, to have a great plant panel for you. Um, my name is Emily Chi. I'm the director of Tech Telecom and Media at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, and I'm really excited um, to have a panel. Um, so first we have Brandon Forrester. He's national organizer um, with Media Justice. He is a phenomenal leader on all of these issues. Um, and so we're really excited to have him. Um, we also have Diego Tulir Snyder, um, who is a senior research manager at Aspen Latinos and um, does a lot of leadership around digital equity programs for Aspen Latino. So we're very lucky to have him with us today. Um, and we also have Dr. Fallon Wilson, who is the vice president of tech policy, multicultural media, um, telecom and internet council. Um, and she has been doing some great work around um, reaching communities where they are um, to make sure that they are included um, in, in our broadband outreach work. So we're really excited to have three people who are actively working in the communities, um, making sure that 
communities of color are connected and included and that the policies that are built to serve them actually will serve them. Um, so thank you all for your incredible work. So first, let's just start with understanding the gap. You know, we have had a lot of conversation, especially with the pandemic, about why the internet is essential and how there is a gap in connectivity. Um, we often talk about, you know, how there's a rural divide um, from the urban divide. Um, but what we don't hear as much about are the specific challenges that communities of colors face when um, we're talking about broadband connections and why the strategies to reach them have to be targeted and specific. It can't be just a big mainstream outreach push. So um, maybe we can start with Dr. Fallon Wilson and, and we'd love to go around and hear about what each of your organizations has been doing and how you're seeing the problem specifically for our communities. Um, thank you so much for moderating, Emily. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I work at the Multicultural Media Telecom Internet Council. It's a very long name, um, but we lovingly call it MMTC. Um, and part of the work that we do for the last 36 years was to advocate for equity and um, parity within telecom, internet, um, innovation, and, and broadcasting. Uh, we have been behind some of the most important briefs around making sure that people of color have access to those spaces. Um, I get to do great work because I get to work with, you know, the most hot topic of the moment, which is how to ensure that communities have access to internet. I don't say broadband often because I think that's also part of the challenge. The languaging of DC doesn't necessarily translate well to on the ground when trying to organize people. I think one church woman told me, I think she was a deacon. She's like, what is a broadband? Is it a bra, Fallon? I'm like, no, it's not a bra, Mother Montgomery. It is what we call internet. Well, why don't you just say internet, baby? And, and, so, and so if I had to begin my comments, I would say translation has been a challenge. Um, but the bigger challenge for me is, is probably the ethos that happens when you want to help people of color and poor people in this country. The assumption by those who have the resources, right, is that if we build it, they will come. It is, it is consistently, it is always the default mechanism for when we want to help communities. And like the field of dreams, just because you build it, they don't come, right? And so you have to build the networks too. And an example of that was the first iteration of the emergency broadband benefit. So we have an internet subsidy now and it's great and people will run to it. Um, but oh my goodness, we have to do enrollment. Oh my goodness, we need money to do outreach. One of the main feedback that we got because we work with African-American churches across the country and denominations and non-denominations and nonprofits to educate them about digital equity. And one of the main challenges that came back to us was Dr. Wilson, we agree with you. You don't have to sell us on this. The pandemic has shown that we need the internet at least to connect with our parishioners and do our social ministries work, right? But, um, but the CDC, the Center for Disease Control gave us money to do vaccines in our parking lots. We could buy, you know, laptops and I mean, iPads to do registrations and enrollment and to do tracking. Is there any dollars from the federal communication to do this to enroll people into the emergency broadband benefit? Once again, you build it, you think they come. And I had to tell them no. Why? Because we believe that waste, fraud, and abuse is the cornerstone of American democracy. You must guard against those things when the truth of the matter is we need to put more money and resources into community-based and cultural institutions on the ground to have an effective strategy for digital equity. And so it was, I was happy, and I'm pretty sure both of my colleagues would agree, that in this new affordable connectivity program moment, where the FCC does have dollars, right? But they don't know how to do granting, right? Because they're a regulatory body. And so that's a whole nother set of important challenges that we have to work through alongside the FCC. Um, and so for me, when I think about why don't we have, why don't we have a movement on the ground? It's because those who have privileges and resources here within the DC Beltway, we have not necessarily figured out number one, how to translate the language. And number two, we don't center community in our design ethics. They should be alongside of us co-creating this moment. But we, once again, we build the field of dreams and expect for them to come and they don't. And they don't have to actually. I don't feel bad, I, I don't penalize people for not coming to something that they didn't have ownership in. 
Right. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Those are all such important points um, and, and certainly a challenge that we're seeing at our organization where um, it not only is the translation issue a problem, it's also, you know, the levels of digital literacy. It's also how can the, all this information be online and the application itself be online when the whole point is to do outreach to folks who aren't online yet. So really understand who are we designing for, who are we actually trying to target and what is their lived reality like and how do we actually incorporate their input and their lived experiences? You know, Like how can we design for a group that we don't actually understand or include? So really great. Um, perspective to consider for those who are designing and building and, and drafting this type of legislation and policy. Thank you. Um, so next I'll move on to Brandon with Media Justice. If you can talk a little bit about what you all are seeing with the racial and um, digital divide and, and how you all are starting to work on it. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, being invited to be a part of this panel. And I think I'm gonna parallel a lot of what uh, Dr. Fallon shared. So to start off, Media Justice, we're an organization that's fighting for racial, gender, and economic justice in the digital age. Um, we have a network, a media justice network of over 100 organizations that includes uh, artists, artist collectives, community media makers, uh, folks that are providing internet to people in the community, like community technologists. Um, it also involves folks at Utility Reform Network. So we have all kinds of folks in our network. And I think when we talk about this, we really should talk about it is a racial digital divide, not just as a digital divide. Um, and you mentioned this kind of mythology, Emily, that we always hear about urban versus rural. And of course, that's racial coding. When they're saying urban, that's coded for black people. And when they say ur rural, that's coded for white people. And we know that that's not true. We know that actually the biggest gap is an affordability gap, and that impacts people in both urban and rural places and also in tribal areas. But we also know, and it was really perfectly highlighted by a report out of the Joint Center, that the people that are on the that are furthest divided by the digital divide are the folks in the Black rural South. And so there we have Black folks in rural places who are part of the digital divide, despite this kind of mythology we have about the urban versus rural myth. Um, and I think that for us, really, you know, a lot of the conversations, a lot of the, the infrastructure money that we see, even the emergency broadband benefit, a lot of this, we're thinking about digital equity, but really what we're seeing is just trying to get people connected, basic access. We're talking really about just faster speeds and lower prices. And that's the smallest part, I think, of the fight that we have ahead of us. Um, because frankly, uh, to, to kind of paraphrase, there's an incredible, the most second to the most recent edition of Logic Magazine, had an article in an interview with Andre Brock Jr., who wrote the book Distributed Blackness about black culture online and black uh, kind of cyber cultures. And one of the things that he said in that interview was that, look, our people see the digital divide. They see what's on the other side of that bridge. They can beat that. And that's not for them. They don't want any part of it. I also heard that, too. I went to Dr. Fallon's event last night, Broadband for Black Churches, and we heard the same thing. We heard that from the Reverend Doctor. We heard from the pastors and people in their congregation don't necessarily want that digital divide to, that, they don't want that gap to be closed because they don't trust what's out there. The chat was blown up. And you know what people were talking about in the chat was privacy, was about digital surveillance. So these are the things we have to think about when we're talking about this. It's not just getting our communities access to good technological systems. We also have to think about all of these harmful systems that always have access to our people. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say uh, that ties to this also is, you know, I think a lot of what we hear is the solution is just competition, competition, competition. We know that there's an issue with monopoly, duopolies, where people don't have choices. But we also know that in a capitalist system, it's competition, a win or lose system that, that, that leads to monopolies. Monopolies don't just happen. They happen because we, win, we live in a win or lose situation. The real remedy is cooperation. It's collectivism at the local level. And so the only way that we're going to change this, because there was an FTC report that came out last year. Folks know that Google, Facebook, Amazon, these places are tracking you, participating in digital surveillance. But the report from the FTC said, wait a second, your internet service provider is doing just as bad or worse. And not just because they have a monopoly over your internet service, but they're these vertical monopolies. So they know what you're watching on television because they're your cable provider, they're your cell phone provider, and they can connect all of these places you're going, everything you're doing. They know everything about you. And so really the solutions that we have to have 
like you were saying, we have to look at design. We have to involve community. And the only solutions that we're going to have are not having AT&T or Verizon or Comcast and more competition in more areas. We have to essentially abolish them. We have to do that by building out local solutions that are accountable to people. Now, that can look like community mesh networks, neighborhood networks. That can look like co-ops. That can look like small private businesses. But at the end of the day, it's got to be local solutions that our communities are a part of. And so I go on and on, but I'll stop there so I don't keep going on and on. No, thank you. I think um, you've just given even more examples um, to bolster Dr. Wilson's point that having that active, you know, input and um, yeah, having community members actually share what they think and how they feel is really important because, you know, you just shared how one of the assumptions is that, well, people just don't know that internet is so valuable and why they should be on it. And if you talk to anyone who is is an intended beneficiary of these programs, it's clear, like, no, they know that already. That's not the problem. And we would have known that if we even had one conversation with community. And um, Brandon makes your example of how a lot of these folks are very aware of some of the risks and dangers and harms that come from being connected um, and kind of want to resist that just reminds me of, you know, we have to really rely on trusted messengers here because why would people trust a system and an agency and a government that has created the digital divide intentionally against their communities anyway, right? There's a history of these systems being built to exclude us, to harm us. And so for that entity to then reach out and say, hey, we created this great program for you without community input and engagement and trusted messengers just really doesn't make sense. And um, one thing that I'd love for us all to talk about, and maybe we can wait until we go to our, our third panelist, but is um, the role of historical redlining and what that means for what we're seeing today with digital redlining. Um, Cause it's not just, oh, our, our communities don't have awareness or they don't see the value in internet. It really is an infrastructure problem where they've been um, excluded intentionally. So maybe that's something you all can think about and I'll ask about next. But um, before we do that, I will now pass it off to Diego, um, who is at Aspen Latino, to talk a little bit more about how you all are seeing it from the Latino perspective. Thank you, Emily. It is uh, really nice to be with all of you here today. Um, so uh, basically the point that Brandon and Dr. Fallon made before about the importance of community-based organizations uh, resonated with, with, with me and with the work we are doing at the Aspen Latinos and Society. We are one of uh, about 80 policy programs at the Aspen Institute. Uh, we were uh, founded in 2015 with the goal of working towards uh, more economic opportunity for uh, the Latinos communities in the US. And we do so through uh, different projects, but one of our main ones is the City Learning and Action Lab, an initiative with, uh, that, that basically focuses on working with seven Latino majority cities around the US with uh, a steering committee in each of these cities that uh, has community-based organizations, the local Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, local entrepreneurial um, ecosystem organizations, uh, the city management uh, office, uh, in order to identify uh, a strategic initiative that can support Latino businesses and Latino entrepreneurs to recover from COVID-19 and to thrive in the new economy. And uh, of course, we understand that uh, in the digital economy, technology is a must for uh, Latino business owners, Latino entrepreneurs, and Latino workers to thrive and prosper. So this is one of our main uh, buckets of work. And um, well, in terms of uh, digital digital equity, there is uh, there, there are plenty of gaps that affect the Latino community. Uh, as it was said before, it's not only about broadband connectivity, where Latinos are uh, facing barriers in terms of uh, accessing high quality, high speed internet at affordable prices. It's also about uh, accessing digital devices uh, that now after the pandemic experience, we know that it's not about having one computer in a household, it's about every single member of the household having internet enabled devices in order to uh, be able to connect to education, in order to be able to connect to work, to connect with healthcare services. Uh, it's also about digital skills. Uh, there was a national skills coalition report in 2020 that identified that Latino workers uh, are the demographic uh, that has the um, lowest level of access to digital skill training 
Around 57% of Latino workers have low to no digital skills, and this affects their possibility of accessing high paid uh, job opportunities. Uh, there is also a McKinsey uh, Global Institute report from 2019 that identifies Latino workers as the demographic most at risk of job loss due to automation and digitalization. And this is because of many reasons, uh, one of them being uh, unequal access to uh, higher education institutions, but also the fact that Latino workers are overrepresented in industries and sectors where automation and digitalization is act are actually replacing workers. In the example, the, the example is uh, industries such as retail, construction, manufacturing, agriculture, or hospitality. So there is a lot of work to be done in order to ensure that Latinos have uh, full access to digital opportunity. Uh, in the Latino in the Latino society program, we also understand that it's not an issue of uh, digital inclusion. It's about digital success, Latino digital success. And in order for this to happen, it's not only about uh, making sure that Latinos are connected and are uh, active users of technology. It's also about Latinos uh, being creators of technology. Uh, so in this sense, uh, there is a wide underrepresentation of Latinos in the tech uh, industry. Uh, we did a report with k Center, uh, a California-based NGO, uh, last year, uh, and we identified that Latinos nowadays represent uh, barely 7% of uh, tech occupations. Uh, they only represent 4% of tech leadership, only 2% of tech board members, only 2% of venture capital investment professionals, and only 2% of tech, tech startup founders. So uh, if we want to avoid technology to have harmful consequences for communities of color, we need to make sure that communities of color are uh, represented in the technology sector, that they are uh, creating the technology in order to uh, make sure that that technology is answering to uh, their needs and is not harming them through algorithmic biases. So um, we, uh, at the Aspen Latino Social Society program, we are conducting uh, research projects to better understand the needs of the Latino community around the US. It is very important to understand that the Latino community is highly heterogeneous. So there is no one size fits all policy that can give an answer to the different needs of the Latino community. Uh, in this specific topic, it's not the same to uh, answer to the needs of a Latino entrepreneur who is trying to remain uh, competitive by adopting technology in its business model, or uh, a Latino professional who is trying to open a career pathway in the technology industry, or a Latino frontline worker who is highly at risk of uh, job loss due to automation. So uh, the policies that uh, need to be designed have to have this in mind. Uh, it is important to understand the different personas within the, the Latino community. And it's always important to uh, work together with community-based organizations that are trusted by the community in order for those policies to have a proper outreach. So I think that's pretty much it for, for now, but I'm happy to continue with the conversation. Yes, thank you so much. And I think you've done an excellent job of just showing how this issue is interconnected with so many other issues like economic opportunity, like diversity in the workplace and how all of these elements are really important to achieving equity in this space. Um, so I'd love to open it up to all of you now to kind of discuss, you know, we've already kind of done this, but what are some of the historical or systemic issues at play? Um, you know, we talk about um, broadband as something that seems like it's kind of in a bubble sometimes, but you know, what are the issues that are, you know, communities are regularly facing or have faced throughout history that we have to consider when we think about, you know, internet access policies that are going to actually lift up our the specific communities that each of you serve. Maybe we can um, start with Brandon. Yeah. Um, well, I want to return. Uh, answer that question to, to what you mentioned before about digital redlining. And obviously that, that calls for um, historical redlining. But I think that now we've really kind of actually narrowed what redlining was when we talk about digital redlining. Of course, if you look at the redlining maps of cities like Baltimore, Detroit, New York, all across the United States, and you look at those neighborhoods that were, that were cut off or that our people were forced into, um, and you overlay the maps today of places that are not connected, it's the same map. It's the same map. We know that. But that's not all that digital redlining is. That's not all that redlining was. Redlining, of course, was about 
keeping people from having access to all of our cities and all of our resources and education and economic opportunity. But it was also more specific than that. It was about people's specific access to housing. It was a federal program. It was a state program. It was a city program. And so if we bring that forward to today, we also understand if we don't just think about access to helpful systems, but also these other systems and resources that we're excluded from. So it's not just digital inclusion, it's digital exclusion. We still see that through algorithmic bias, through targeted advertising, we, we know about the subprime uh, home lending that particularly impacted black and brown communities. Those people were targeted through digital advertising that was built on top of surveillance. So when we talk about digital redlining, you know, it's important that we talk about the geographies of it. It's important that we look at those maps and understand, but it's also important that we understand that there's more to the history than just looking at those maps. There were regulations, there were policies, there was culture that was a part of that, that, that forced those things to happen. And so I think we need to think about that too. And so what I, one of the examples I always think about is we have folks in Detroit that are part of our network. And I think about a student in Detroit during the pandemic that was just trying to get education. Now, they couldn't get access to the internet at home. Part of that might have been because they were lived in a neighborhood where there just weren't wires. Part of that could have been because there just wasn't affordable internet. But the walk that that student had to take to get to the internet, they were tracked by all kinds of technological systems. There were facial recognition systems that were cameras that were connected directly to fiber, but that fiber didn't go to those students' houses. And so I just want to expand what people are thinking when they think about digital redlining to also think about it as not just the maps, but also everything else that made those maps possible. Right. It makes me um, think back to what Dr. Wilson was talking about, also about where we make our decisions about where to invest money and resources um, and how often that's not actually reaching the communities um, that we're trying to include. Um, Dr. Wilson, I wonder if you can add some thoughts. Oh, no, I, I agree with Brandon. Um, I serve on the Communication, Equity and Diversity Council for the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and part of the charter is to deal with these types of intersecting issues, especially this new charter, this new iteration. And many of you know that FCC is looking for public comments on digital discrimination. And so for me, I situate there. This is not just about digital redlining, it is about all forms of discrimination that allow, that do not allow people of color in particular to make choices for their lives and for their families. I give the example all the time. I get to wear two hats. Nationally, I do policy work and I advocate. Locally in Nashville, Tennessee, I serve on, I wrote our smart city, report through equity. I raised $200,000 from the pandemic to do a mixed methodology to study digital access and equity issues in Davidson County. So I know municipal politics very well. And I also know that they're not equally distributed when it comes to library dollars for public computing within Davidson County. I was floored a couple of, maybe about two years ago when we were doing some research there to only realize that predominantly you know, affluent neighborhoods, predominantly white, got all of the, the, the dollars to upgrade their libraries and digital access and access. Communities where there were immigrant and people of color, not so much. To me, that is digital discrimination. And, and it's not just, if, you gotta have an intersectional framework for talking about racial oppression in this world of digital resources, right? And I think digital redlining is important but in addition to that, there's a host of other ways that people do, and to Brandon's point, not just historically, but currently create systems that keep Black and Brown and Latino and immigrant and undocumented communities from having access. I can even begin to talk about what it means to be a cashless society and then the roots from what that looks like. I can even begin to talk about telehealth, not just from the access point of view of connectivity, but what does it mean to have black and melanated skin and your doctor doesn't understand that through visual or you don't have the great pixelations of being able to upload video and they can see your skin as a dermatologist. What I'm trying to say is it would behoove us as we do all the rulemaking at the federal level to really put guardrails around digital discrimination that allows for a large swath of bad actors to be held accountable. And part of it is really looking at 
Yeah, anything that keeps black and brown immigrant and undocumented communities from being able to make a free choice, not one that's constructed by the system, we should dismantle it. And I'm a big fan of Cape Poor Diego. They funded some of my research back in the day and I work with Lily um, and um, Allison on many you know, amazing opportunities to support um, people of color in this space. And I love their Leaky Tech Pipeline. I think it's a great way to think about intersectionality and disparities within these systems that we're building for an automated future. You see, I didn't mention anything. My two amazing brethren, if those are the pronouns you go by, so forgive me, for saying that if, if you don't, I have, I have no fight in this moment to push people to understand that piece of the world until we can level the playing field for broadband. I think, I think we have amazing organizations doing that work, but I think the main work, at least on the ground, is educating people about these dollars that are coming into cities and how they should steer those dollars and how they should develop their own inclusive and diverse task force to hold states and municipalities accountable for what their cities need. Um, and so for me, when I think about digital discrimination, I, I, I see it as you got to write it in such a way that you can get the utmost good and hold the up the many actors, right? Whether they're conscious of it or unconscious of it, um, accountable for how they treat and disrespect and silence and alienate and create objects, right? Of people of color in this country. Wow, that was really powerful, Dr. Olson. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and it seems like um, a great transition to Diego um, to talk a little bit more about this issue. Thank you, Emily. So uh, just to add to what Dr. Fallon and Brandon already said, uh, one of the main uh, aspects we normally focus on in, in, in our research projects is uh, the education piece and how uh, many jobs have increasingly required four-year college degrees with, without really uh, needing those, um, those, those skills that are taught through the four-year college degree for, for, the, for the kind of skills required for that position, and how this has become like a, an, an additional barrier to uh, many Latino workers to access high-quality jobs. And we really respect the, the job that uh, an organization such as Digital Nest is doing in California, where they are working with high school students to provide them digital upskilling, and then they work with them as consultants to provide um, um, digital um, marketing services to small businesses in the neighborhood uh, that normally wouldn't be able to pay for those in order for them to develop their website presence, their e-commerce platform presence, or uh, brand uh, development. And then these, these uh, high school students then have uh, uh, a, rele a relevant job experience that they can put in their resume and they can transition into uh, jobs in the tech sector without the need of going through uh, a four-year college degree that is highly expensive and uh, adds to the debts that households already have. So uh, it's, it's also an issue to, to, to bear in mind. Um, we also... Um, respect the work that Austin Community College is currently doing around this topic. They developed the uh, Digital Fluency for Today's Jobs initiative, uh, basically consists of a platform for digital upskilling, not only of their students at the community college, but also uh, in the community, in the broader community as a whole. And uh, through micro-credentials, they are providing uh, the digital skill training that many people need in order to succeed at their jobs or uh, as entrepreneurs. So uh, it is very important to look at these uh, experiences and how um, alternative pathways uh, to education can also be a solution to ensure higher equity in the space. Thank you so much, Diego, um, and all of you for not only just uh, being here today and giving us really incredible learnings from this conversation, but for all of the work that you are doing each and every day to lift our communities up and to correct some of these historical wrongs and, and make sure that these opportunities are available to all of us. Um, so um, in closing, love to go around and ask all of you, you know, we have a variety of folks tuning in today to listen to this conversation, but what is one thing that you'd like them to take away or if they want to get more involved or want to learn more what's something that they can do? Um, so first we'll start with Dr. Fallon. Um, if you don't mind doing some closing remarks. 
Um, first of all, thanks again for having me. Um, once again, we work with African-American churches from across the country. Um, we work with them on educating them about originally the emergency broadband benefit, then the affordable connectivity program. I tell you the naming of these things. It's funny. I laugh as a person who understands the world. Um, my church is like, these names are so cumbersome. I said, I know it would help if the FCC and Congress had a PR branding strategist, UX like team, like that digital services that they once had under President Obama would help with some of this. But um, I would simply say to get more involved in the work that we're doing, you can go to www.blackchurchesfordigitalequity.com and there you can learn about the work that we're doing um, nationally and locally. I would also say, um, yeah, Tune in to our FCC diversity and equity meetings. I always miss that name up too. Hold on, what is it called? I wrote it down, Communications and Equity Committee um, because we need more eyes and thoughts and support. And I suspect that um, a lot of those organizations that are members of this committee will be reaching out to amazing folk like Brandon and Diego to be thought leaders as we talk about digital discrimination and other forms of things that we need rulemaking on, right? Um, and lastly, I would say, yeah, hold Southern states accountable and Northern states and Western and East. I'm not calling them out, but Southern states have such a special place in my heart. And we need to make sure that they have the resources that they need to ensure, at least for the majority of African-American people that live in Southern states, um, that they have the resources needed that are coming down from the infrastructure bill and digital equity dollars. Thank you so much, Dr. Olson. Um, I'll pass it to Brandon. Uh, I guess closing thoughts I want to leave folks with is that the digital divide is not just about faster speeds and lower prices. That is a part of it, but we have to think much further than that. And we have to think much further than, than just devices and digital literacy also. Digital literacy is a, is a mitigation tactic for these environments which are inherently unsafe and insecure trying to teach people how to navigate them. We need to take ownership so that we can actually make sure that we're building out communities that are safe and secure for our people. We don't need better locks. We need better communities. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, uh, I've spent a lot of my capacity working with folks like Emily on trying to make sure that the emergency broadband benefit existed and led to an affordable connectivity program. I also have mixed feelings about creating a subsidy that's that's going in to, to fund these providers that have created the digital divide. But this is the last thought I'll leave you with is like, really, if you're in a community and you're working with people and you're a trusted messenger, help people sign up for that because we need to get whatever we can by any means necessary for our people. And so don't be shy about it. I know that there's mistrust of these providers and of the government and of government programs, but it's a really important thing. And so, although it's not just about lower uh, prices and faster speeds, if we can help knock down that price of that unaffordable internet for folks, we should do that really important work too. Okay, thank you, Brandon, for all the work you continue to do on that front. Um, Diego? Thank you. So uh, to anyone who is interested in learning more about our work, I um, encourage you to visit our website. We uh, have both in person and uh, virtual events very often, uh, bringing in specialists and experts on um, Latino business uh, and entrepreneurship uh, development, on Latino digital inclusion and success. So uh, you're more than welcome to join in. Uh, we also have all our reports and articles uh, posted on our website. And uh, just as a, um, a closing remark or thought, uh, just to, to, to align with Brandon and Dr. Fallon in uh, how important it is to think about this topic uh, from an intersectionality lens. And in the case of the Latino community, uh, as I said before, it's an incredibly heterogeneous uh, uh, and, and and, and rich uh, community, uh, culturally rich community. So it's important to understand also how this is impacting uh, Latina women, Afro-Latinos, indigenous Latinos. Uh, and sometimes there is like very, uh, very uh, insufficient information uh, disaggregated within the Latino community. So it's important to improve data availability. And in this sense, we are starting a new project 
that involves uh, case studies in each of the cities where we are currently working with our city learning and action lab to understand the nuances and how the digitalization of the economy is impacting different economic um, structures and different uh, Latino communities around the country. So uh, basically that, thank you again for the opportunity and it, it's been a pleasure to share this panel with Brandon and Dr. Fallon as well. Thank you, Emily. Yes, thank you to each of you again. Um, and I hope that those who are tuning in will make sure that they follow um, all of the organizations and all three of these individuals because they're people who, you know, just beyond their day-to-day -day jobs are doing tremendous work for our communities and are really leading us in this space. So I really encourage you all to continue following the work of all three of our panelists. Um, before ending our conversation today, I'd like to invite everyone to continue the conversation on Twitter. Um, you can use the event hashtag um, DIS22 and digital breakthrough. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And thank you again to our three phenomenal panelists um, for joining us, for educating us and doing this really, really difficult, um, but um, absolutely critical work on the ground. We appreciate you, admire you and like you all. Thank you so much. Most Americans think about the digital divide as the disparity between those who benefit from the internet and digital technologies and those who don't. Families who are living in poverty, they don't have access to the same tools and resources that others do. So they're disconnected from what's happening in the community. Family Gateway was started as a response to a population that we don't typically think about when we think about homelessness, and that's families with children. So here at the Family Gateway Shelter, they will use these wonderful computers for education, for jobs, for looking for housing. They'll use the computers to connect to the outside world. There's a lot to be excited about when we open up these centers. And I know that inside of that excitement is the opportunity for them to grow, achieve their educational ambitions, and then be a productive part of society.